Greetings from Podcastville. It's Wednesday, the 19th of June. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by Manscaped. Let me tell you something. Uncle Joey's here to tell you one thing and one thing only. Don't cut your dick off, fucko. The suffering and the anxiety ends now, today. With Manscaped, you get it done without the pain. You're like, Joey, what the fuck is Manscaped? Manscaped, they have precision tools for the family jewels, if you know what I mean. Manscaped has redesigned the electric razor, okay? Their invention is called the Lone Mower, a handheld razor with skin-safe technology so fucking tremendous it won't nick or snag your nutsack or your fucking love pole. You can't get that from nobody else. <laughs> you want to go easy on what the Lord gave. You ever have your wife try to fucking trim your nut hairs, the anxiety and the grief? You close your eyes. You're like, fuck it. It's a 50-50 fucking shot. I'm going to sing like a fucking bird after this. You don't know what's going to happen. But hey, I could talk here to the fucking tongue till my tongue is green. All I got to tell you is one thing. Manscaped works. They also have a crop preserver, a specially formulated deodorant so your balls don't stink like dick. And the Reviver, a sprint that tones and refreshes your nutsack and the area around your fucking stick, dick, so it smells cool, it's refreshed. We're going into the summer season now, you understand me? You want to have that area fucking tip-top, Magoo, because you never know what's going to happen. Listeners of the church, the church family can get 20% off your first order when you use promo code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H, at manscaped.com. And if you order the perfect package, They'll also throw in a free travel bag when you use promo code CHURCH. That's manscaped.com. Use promo code CHURCH to get not 10, but 20% off your first order. Just remember, it's summertime. You want to keep your balls clean. Also, the church is also brought to you by one of my favorite fucking products in the world, cbdlion.com. Listen to me. Everywhere you drive now, you see a sign. We got CBD. We got this. We got that. You don't know what the fuck you're buying. With CBD line, you know what the fuck you're getting. Why? I'll tell you why. One, number one, they make CBD products from start to finish. CBD line has you covered. Whether it's the vape, the cartridges, the shatter, tincture, gummies, CBD line is the way to go. Number two, I'll tell you why I'd go with CBD line. Because you can check their third-party lab re results yourself on their website when you go to cbdlion.com. That's why. So do me a favor. If you're looking for, you, you haven't been, I don't know where to get it. I don't know which brand to get. Listen, Uncle Joey fucking knows. I'm 56. I throw sidekicks for Jesus. And I go strength fucking training. And I'll tell you what's keeping me together. cbdlion.com. So go to cbdlion.com and press in church on the way out. C-H-U-R-C-H and get 20% off your first order, all right? Who's better than you? Kick this motherfucking meal, Lee. What can I say? <laughs> How are you? All right, great, man. Great to see you. You look beautiful. Thank you. It's yeah. great to be here, man. Life has been very kind to you. You've been very kind to life. Uh, yeah, yeah. It works I, out that way. You know, before we even start talking, uh, my introduction to you was the same way I was introduced to Richard Pryor as a child. So... As you were getting closer to come on, the emotions started to come up. You're a big part of my childhood. Oh, uh, great! You know, when I was when I was 15, this, the word on the street was, if you don't have Led Zeppelin too at your house, like if I walked into your house, you invited me in, I go, hey, well, you want a beer? You want to get high? Yeah, let's uh, pick a record. And I go through your thing, and I don't see Led Zeppelin too. I walk out of your house. <laughs> there was one point in life where we walked into your house. And you didn't have big bamboo. We couldn't hang out with you. We couldn't hang out with yeah, you. Yeah. We couldn't hang out with you. Like, where's big bamboo? Ah, uh -uh, my mother didn't give me the money yet. Listen, call me when your mom gives you the money. Because you ain't that fuck. You ain't shit, bitch. If you didn't have that big fucking thing. You know, I started smoking pot maybe 1975. I kept it in the closet. Yeah. I, I was like a gay guy on uh I was like a gay guy on uh, on uh, on Beverly Boulevard. Like, <laughs> I, I wasn't ready for Santa Monica yet, and, <laughs> and I was like, I wasn't letting nobody know I got high. And the first album I listened to that guy, you know, I'm Cuban born, sure, Catholic raised, yeah. And then, but let's back it up a little bit before I even got high. 
I had a sister. I had a. I went to Catholic boarding school, and the nuns used to beat us. And one day, some kid brought in a fucking album, and we put it on during class. And Sister Mary Elephant. Sister Mary Elephant. <laughs> you know, shut up. So our goal in those days was to go in and torture the nuns the same <laughs> way those kids were torturing the Sister Mary Elephant. So that was the first beginning of it. You know, who are these guys? Cheech and Chong, blah, blah, blah. You know, some kid had the album from the Bronx, and then Big Bamboo. And I had Big Bamboo and Los Cochinos. Sure. And one of my all-time friends, because my mother had a bar. Mm -hmm. So my mother, they talked about drugs and tecata in the house and, you know, reefer and shit. Yeah. Fucking how to make a drug deal or let's yeah, make a drug deal. Like, deal. like, I will never forget that. These yeah. are, you know, it's like I don't forget Richard Pryor, nigga meets wino. <laughs> yeah. uh, nigga meets, uh, wino meets Dracula. <laughs> you know, those bits, <laughs> I, they'll be in my mind forever. forever. Sister Mary Elephant will be in my mind forever, yeah. and let's make a dope deal, because it was like a, a spoof on let's make a deal. Yeah. Fucking, you know. So I just want to start with that. Sure. I still remember going to Jersey City on a Saturday and doing mm -hmm. micro dot acid mm -hmm. and seeing Up in Smoke with 29 kids in a movie theater. <laughs> <laughs> and losing your mind when they made the when they made the truck out of marijuana and shit and the mufflers started burning it and all the security guards were fucking high. You know, this was just that was our life. Yeah. It was coming to see you, watch you, and then I'm sure you were one of the motivators in us smoking dope. I'm not gonna blame it on you like <laughs> Judas Priest made me kill myself. Go fuck yourself, all right? <laughs> Judas Priest didn't hang your kid, you dumb fuck. You did. Well, we used to say, you know, when when they came down on us, you know, we'd we'd be on radio stations, you know, and they would be, you know, how do you feel, you know, turning all these kids on to drugs and that, and so my thing was, in fact, I said, what if we're right? What if what we were doing back then was the right thing to do, and it turned out to be the right thing, and so now that is legal, man. It's like. You know, you know, Cheech and I both walk around like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did it, man. You know, it's it's legal, and it should be because it's healthy. Yeah, it's just another day in paradise with it marijuana. Is. Yeah, it is. Especially if you've done the spectrum of drugs. Like I, I, <laughs> I was an asshole growing up. I was yeah. a criminal, so I did the spectrum of drugs. What kind of crime? I was a fucking petty thief, oh, yeah. a coke dealer. You know, I did whatever. My mom died, and I. I lost faith in the system. I lost faith in myself, and I just did anything I could do to. It was this in Jersey, in Jersey, New York City area. Yeah, yeah. and uh, well, that's what you do. And, and you know, you break down and and you just do shit. And one day I got in trouble, and did I learn my lesson? Fuck no. You know, I came out and kept fucking around. But well, you found out how to get into the best prisons. Yeah. Well, you find that it's funny. The guy that got me into the best prison died. Uh huh. Two weeks ago, I got the email last oh. week. I went to him before I got locked up because mm -hmm. him and I had similar crimes. So I went to him and he goes, I'll make calls for you. So when I got the diagnostic, I already had an in. Oh, yeah. And that's very important. As soon as I got the diagnostic, they said, ask for this certain guy. Tell him that K-Bass sent you. God rest his soul. And, you know, I had the best slippers. <laughs> well, yeah, same as me when yeah. I, when they, when they were going to put me in, uh, the word went out, you know, and I'm such a celebrity with everybody in the in the system. Oh in my the prison god, system. yeah, I can just imagine. And so <laughs> when, when I got there, it was like a it was a a, a royal wet greeting. You know, the, <laughs> everybody lined up outside the prison and how are you doing, Mister Chong? <laughs> and they said uh, for. Um, tradition or whatever it is legally they have to handcuff me to walk in into the door and then once i'm in the door they take off the handcuffs it's just symbolic because actually they let me uh you know self uh what do you call it surrender self surrender yeah and so uh vanity fair sent a, sent me a writer and a lemo to take me from my house to prison and so we rode up <laughs> to prison in a limousine, got stopped by the cops for speeding, and the driver said, "We got Tommy Chong going to prison." The guy said, "Okay, go ahead, you know, <laughs> no ticket, just just get him into jail." And when I got there, when I when they processed me in, uh, they had me. There was two prisons. There's the main the main 
joint in the in the big in the front of the prison, and I was in the camp at the back, and so when you go through the front door, you know it's a real lockdown. The the official language in that prison was Spanish, so so it was a tough tough prison. Behind there was the camp, and it was up full of celebrities and lawyers and doctors and and white collar people. And so the guy that had to drive me there, uh, as soon as I got in the truck, to, in the pickup truck, he pulls out a Cheech and Chong album. <laughs> he says, well, "Will you sign this for me?" <laughs> and so, and then when I got in the joint, I, I was greeted, and the first guy would greet me was a little Spanish guy named uh, Tony, and he he goes, "Hey, come on, I got some uh, handpicked uh, dickies, you know, the the uniform you have to wear." He had some uh, what do you call it, antique dickies that they were saving. You know, he's a clothes guy, and so and so I got I got these. I had a beautiful uniform. <laughs> it was crazy, man. And all I did when I was there, besides uh, go to school, I went to school. I uh, I had free reign basically, and the uh, I, the only thing I, I I really started doing the minute I walked in was was take pictures with the inmates and then the visiting thing filled up because they heard I was there and, and so it was like a meet and greet every, <laughs> every, every Sunday and then they they said okay no more pictures uh, you know that that was a big deal from there but it was it was it was fun then we shot a video and I they let me use the warden's office and you know <laughs> you know how it is when you're when you're shooting a movie you can tell everybody to shut up everybody Tip shuts up and so uh, we didn't have we we're just sitting around bullshitting and i said because i could hear the warden everybody walking and talking and that so i just leaned my head out the door and goes hey quiet in here we're, we're shooting and they, and they oh okay so, <laughs> and so I, had, I had the warden tiptoeing around everybody tiptoeing around what prison did you now you you were going to charge with a federal yeah it was okay. a fed so you ended up going to lompoc no i went to taft and where's Taft? Taft's outside of uh, Bakersfield. Okay. Yeah, just outside of Bakersfield. It was uh, originally a woman's prison. And so we had showers with doors on them. <laughs> we had the shitters with doors on. You know, it was, it was a woman's prison. So how, many, how many people in the prison? In, uh, in our camp, there was, uh, I think, 400. Four, that's a lot. 200, 200 in each. There's two dormitories, A and B. And uh, and they had uh, a gay dormitory, a gay old man dormitory. That's when I was in, and then uh, B, uh, you know, the other prisoners. But you had to be nonviolent. And right, there was a lot of things. That, that's it was I, a camp. It was a camp. It was, we had running tracks. We had you couldn't weight lift anymore. They 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 stopped the weights, and so everybody was like chin ups and you know dips. And but they had a running track and a football field, a basketball court. And I was I was taking tango at the time, uh, tango dancing. So I used to go to the basketball court and practice my tango walk. And and because I'm an entertainer, you know, I'm used to people looking at me, so I wasn't worried about that. <laughs> and so I had a big contingency of bikers. There's a lot of uh, peaceful bikers and Mongols and <coughs> Hell's Angels and a lot of those guys. But they they were hardened criminals, but they were peaceful, so they they were in the camp. And they, they would gather around to watch me walk, do my tango walk. And then one day, uh, Steve, the big old biker, goes, Hey, Chong, you don't have to dance alone here. I'll dance with you. Har, 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 har. So I walked over to him because in tango, dancing with men is, is quite common. So I took him in my arms. And <laughs> <laughs> he got all homophobic. Oh, no. Geez. And he became my best friend and my dog. And so uh, when we were... And and I, he was like my cheech man. I had I tortured the shit out of this guy. <laughs> like we'd play pool and I beat him, and then I wouldn't play him again because <laughs> I'm. A <laughs> and he was a pool shark, and so and he might have let me beat him the first game, but I wouldn't. I'd never played him again the whole night. <laughs> the whole time I was there, you had a good time in there. Didn't you? Oh man, I had, I had a, a good time. I had the best. Time. I had a good time. I had the best. It's great. Time. How long? How much time did you did they make you do? Nine months. Nine months. Nine months. Yeah. And it goes fast. It went really. How was fast. the food in your situation? Well, we had our own private chef, 
<laughs> sounds like good fellas. Yeah, exactly. We had a, uh, his name is Eric Larson. He's a, a pro golf caddy. He was a golf caddy for Mark Kalkovecki. And he, he was in on a very bum rap, you know, like he, he would buy cocaine from this girl. And, and so the feds busted the girl and they said, we need a name. And, and so they, she gave him Eric's, was, you know, he was the closest to a name that she had. And so the feds went after Eric and they offered him five years. And Eric's, no, he, because he wasn't a dealer. He was a caddy. And so he fought it. And he won, and then they refiled the charges, and he couldn't afford the, the second one. You can't beat the feds. And so uh, he, they, he, they gave him, uh, f f I think, 15 years, and he did 12, 11 when I was there. You know what the most shock? I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I'm not saying that you were scared before you went in, but you had some doubts. You had never been in jail before and all this. I think the biggest shock to you and me was the stories you hear in there yeah. about how the government works. Oh. And oh. if you tell people, like, I would love to sit with somebody for, I have 10 hours yeah. of undercover stories that yeah. people would die. They'd go, Joey, you're lying. And I'm yeah. telling they, you They that can't believe it. You, you cannot believe how the federal government works. There's a guy in there that was, he might still be in there, but he was supposed to be released a year before I went in. And because of the paperwork, they won't they won't release him, and he's got no way to get him. But on the other hand, it's a federal prison, and so they have to give you the medical. And so there, I met guys in there that had never they weren't criminals, but they had to have the open heart surgery or they would die. And so they would c commit a crime <coughs> to end up in the fed federal system and get the get the operation. So it, it's a whole crazy. It's a fucking thing. you would not. People on the streets would not, normal people would go, Joey, I love you, but you're lying. Yeah. That would never happen. Stories of when, because my, I, I was arrested for kidnapping. So they put me in county first. Kidnapping? Yes, but it becomes federal. Kidnapping right. one and two, an well, aggravated she, robbery. She, she wouldn't go up with you? Nah, that little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> she was in love with Harvey Weinstein instead. So <laughs> what happened was when you get arrested for federal and you go in and you're there, I think it takes 72 hours for them to decide whether they're going to charge you on the state. The feds couldn't make a decision up because I had been in trouble in Aspen. I was in on some Aspen type drug stuff and the DA got involved. So until they wanted to talk to me, brief me or whatever to try to make me a deal with DEA, the feds held on to me. Oh. It was like a ploy. And I kept saying, why am I still here after 72 day hours? And they're like, well, they're still deciding. You guys have to decide by now. They don't, the feds are a different game. And then yeah. when people heard me on the phone, they would come over and go, listen, man, that ain't nothing. And he <laughs> would start hearing shit about, you know, uh, this one guy was in there. Now, when you go to prison, you know who's lying to you and you know who's telling you the truth. Yeah, if I'm telling you I'm a kingpin, and all of a sudden I'm bumming a cigarette from you, <laughs> there's a fucking problem. Okay, <laughs> no, the problem is if you yeah. believe them. If you leave them, <laughs> right? If you believe them, but there's guys in there that every visitation they got a different broad visiting them. Yeah, bringing them food, giving them ten thousand. I mean, it's fucking crazy. Yeah, and this guy was telling me a story how, you know, this Fed f was his friend for two years, and he goes, everything I did. The guy did. And he goes, we got so strung out on blow that we started shooting it. He goes, he was a fed shooting it with me. Sure. Shot for shot. Shot sure. for shot. And he goes, I couldn't figure it out when they arrested me. <clears throat> they made me try to make me do a deal real fast. And he goes, I turned it down. My attorney wanted to take it to trial. They kept pushing it back because the guy had become a junkie. And he oh. couldn't get off the coke. And they couldn't figure out how they were going to testify against yeah. him. They had a little bit of tape. The stories are endless. 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 Like yeah. they had a little bit of tape, so they couldn't really prosecute. So this guy waited two years to go on trial, like just because they had to, to clean up. And he goes, the guy came in looking like fucking Johnny Pavarotti two years later, and he denied everything. There's no more coke in his blood. It's your word against mine, and he's a fed, and he's not. You know, when you hear about the half of these... You did a very popular show that I fucking, because 
you did all the movies, then my mother died in 79, and then I went off the deep end, and I lost track of Cheech and fucking Chong. Yeah. I was living up my own Cheech and Chong adventures, <laughs> bringing in vans and guns and shit. Sure. And then one day I'm watching TV, I'm watching my favorite TV show on Friday night, and who fucking pops up? But Chong, has, and it's a great episode about pirates that oh, steal yeah. this cocaine. <laughs> It was one of Miami Vice's. Oh, Miami lap. Vice. It was one of the. And I'm the dealer. <laughs> You're the dealer. But you said a line in there that I still use today. What's that? One of the best lines. First of all, your name was either Jumbo. Your name was Jumbo or yeah. Dumbo, and yeah. you had a chubby yeah. wife with a shotgun yeah. Yeah. and shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he lived in a trailer, and this they come to you first. You cut the deal, and then when they come to you the second time, it's nighttime. And it's young kids. They trust fund kids. Yeah. And they pull up and they leave the lights on. And you pull out like with a fucking gun. And you look at them and you look, turn off the lights. <laughs> this ain't a goddamn spy movie or something. <laughs> Till this day, I still use that fucking line. Turn off the lights, dog. This ain't no fucking spy movie. <laughs> yeah, that was my uh, one Miami Vice. Miami Vice yeah. and stuff. That, that was, was a, fun. That was a great episode. Yeah. Man. Yeah, it was good. But uh, we were getting back to the feds and all that shit. I, there were stories in there yeah. that how they the feds broke up a family. I was in there with a family called the Markleys out of Longmont, Colorado. And they fucking were, what do you, you know, they mow your lawn. Oh, yeah. They started, gardeners. They started the being gardeners. Landscape artists. Yeah. And long, have you ever been to Longmont, Colorado? It's no. outside of Boulder. I've been to Boulder. It's outside of Boulder. It's a, it, Back then, it was a mom and pop community. Yeah. You drove through it. You could smell cow shit. Now, it's a metropolis yeah. because it's next to Boulder. Yeah. But at that time, it, was, it wasn't uh, the, the, the best place in the fucking world. I forgot what I was going to tell you. That. Oh, so the Markley started. The young kid bought a gram of Coke one day, and it went on and so forth. And they were making millions a month selling coke from A to Z in Longmont. They were getting it from some Mexicans. <clears throat> and uh, what they were doing was they were selling half grams and grams or kilos. They were out of their minds. They were yahoos. This, it's 1986. Nobody really knew about cocaine. And it's a mom and pop situation. So he, it was him and his father. They didn't even know how to wash the money. So they started buying tractors <laughs> and fucking lawn mowers. They had 200 <laughs> lawn mowers. It was the only fucking gardening company that was making $2 million on the books. <laughs> they had no idea. It was him and his father cutting trees. They're making $2 million now <laughs> on the books. They didn't even know how to wash the money. That's how they got caught. Yeah. The feds stayed at their house when they arrested them. The feds stayed at their house for 24 hours. And said, when they would call and go, Chung, I'm coming over to pick up an eight ball. They would go, no, nah, this ain't Chung. This is Phil, his nephew. Come on over. They sold Coke for 24 hours without arresting any of the people just to clock the type of business they were doing. Yeah. So they posed as dealers for 24 hours. Everybody who uh. bought Coke from them, that ain't nothing. Then they got arrested. Da, 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 da. They fucking got arrested and they brought him into jail. So it was the father, the son, and the wife. And then they took the, the son and they made up a whole story. They had pictures of, you know, like me and Chong talking, me and you smoking a joint. They put a picture of Chong and the guy's wife together and told him that his father was having an affair with his fucking oh. wife. The feds are cold-blooded. Oh. That's why the tapes, that's why whenever they tape you, you always hire audible experts. You spend the extra 10000 and you hire an ex-FBI guy because the ex-FBI guy will go, yeah. they just mix those in together. Yeah. So it's it's you and Tim, having, it's Tony and Chong having a conversation about eating cake, and all of a sudden you hear my voice going, Chong, make the delivery. Yeah. Yeah, give me 12 cakes. You know, and then they go to court and they go, cakes was kilos. And Chung's sitting there like, what are you talking about? Fucking, <laughs> you've never heard these things. And well, Chung what, will vouch. What they did with me, they, they <clears throat> we had a bong company, glass company. And so uh, Ashcroft and Bush and them, they're starting the Iraqi war. So they needed a diversion, you know. And so they put out the press thing that, that paraphernalia is funding the terrorists. 
<laughs> <laughs> All the money we're making, the billions we're making off bong sales, is, is going into to help the terrorists. And so they put an undercover guy in, in, in our bong company, and all he did was straighten our bong company out. So it was running properly because we were losing money like crazy. That's amazing. And so then when they busted us, they knew that we were losing money. But they had gone on with this thing, and so they needed the name. They needed the, the Cheech and Chong name. And so they, they busted us, and then they, they just gave me a deal. They said, either you give up, or we'll go after your son. Right, I know you stuck up for yeah, your son. And, and, and your wife, because she wrote the check. And, I, and it wasn't a, nothing illegal was going on. But they, uh, and then they had us, they taped us, they taped them trying to buy bongs from us, and our company wouldn't send it to them. They said, no, sorry, we, we, we're not allowed to, uh, to ship the bongs to, uh, to Pennsylvania. And so the feds, came in person to the to the thing and they already had an undercover guy in our business anyway and so they arranged to send uh, a shipment to uh, pennsylvania which gave them the evidence to bust me and it was all illegal it was entrapment it, you know it was undercovers everything the feds did everything you know illegal but when they said either you go or your son goes you know and then i said i'll go for sure you know because I, I, I wanted the adventure anyway. Wow. Were you scared when you walked in? No, not a bit. How not old were bit. you when you walked in? I, I grew up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I was in my 60s, late 60s. I grew up in Canada, in Vancouver, Calgary in Vancouver. And the only people I really knew, because I had a nightclub too, so were gangsters. You know, that was the only people I really knew. So I knew, I knew that life better than I knew, uh, you know, the college life. And so before music, you had a club in Vancouver. Yeah, and then you. I was in a band. Pursued I, music yeah. that was a fucking Motown band. Yeah, or yeah. Is that yeah. true? Oh yeah, yeah. I heard we that had, years ago, and I'm. We like, had one of the best R and B singers in the, in the world. He's dead now, but Bobby Taylor was a legend. And what was the name of your band? Uh, Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's. And the reason it was called Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's was that we never had a name. We were a bar band. And so, so when they said, uh, what's the name of the group? And so we, Bobby and I, he, he got me into comedy. He was like a, a funny, funny guy, very funny. Like all black guys, you know, the, in, the, in the jazz and R&B world, they all, they're all comedians. But the thing is, they can sing, you know, but they can, they can be funny oh. and so when, when when they asked us uh, the name of our band we never had a name and so we were thinking of uh, crazy names and there was a band in texas at the time now this was i had to be 1966 67 yeah around 66 when we got it discovered 1966 there was a band in texas called 10 screaming niggers and so we said why don't we call our band four niggers and a chink and so, okay, so we put it up on the marquee, four niggers in it, now appearing, four niggers in a chink. And that night, uh, we, had, <laughs> we had one audience, one, one customer. <laughs> and it was a very angry black lady wrestler named Lottie the Body. And Lottie sat in the front row. We played a, set, we played a song or two, and she says, well, I see the niggers, but where's the chink? Now, my dad was Chinese, he didn't know about the sign. He's he's a doorman, and so he walked over to her to tell her, you know, you don't talk like that. <laughs> and she picked him up and body slammed him with his ass on the floor. So I threw my guitar down. I ran down there. She picked me up, body slammed my ass, <laughs> and all the brothers on the stage were laughing their ass off. Man. They were just cracking up, and so we changed the name to uh, <laughs> Four Colored Guys and a Chinese Lad. And Motown said, no, 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 no. Now, what year is this? 1966, 67. 66, I'm just getting off the boat from Cuba, playing. Oh, really? They got me here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we did our, our record in 1967. <sighs> and we changed Motown because it was the first uh, interracial song, you know, Does Your Mama Know About Me? And uh, so Diana Ross, was, she was the one that really discovered us. She, she came to the club with the rest of the Supremes. They saw us play, and she fell in love with the... Our, she actually fell in love with the drummer, 
because she stole the drummer as soon as we went to Motown. <laughs> she, she stole our drummer, but that was okay because we had a lot of drummers. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we were the first in a lot of ways. And then we discovered the Jackson Five. They, they uh, opened for us when they were, they won a high school contest. And, and so uh, Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's and Jerry Butler were playing at the uh, Regal Theater in Chicago. And uh, the Jackson Five opened the show. And they were the Jackson Five plus Johnny, because a little cousin there. And so uh, Bobby Taylor told uh, Michael and, and Joe, his father, to, hey, come, come on to Detroit. We'll get you signed with Motown. And so they came and stayed at Bobby's house for uh, about a month. It took a month before they finally auditioned him. And then the rest is history. Did you ever bump into any of the Jacksons? Always. Oh, yeah, we're still pretty... We're tight. We, we we have that history, you know, because uh, Jermaine, Jermaine was really the the one that bonded with me the most. He actually did a cover of "Does Your Mama Know About Me," and I saw Michael. And Cheech never really believed that story, you know, and so when we saw Michael at a at a Grammy, uh, the twenty five year Grammy get together, uh, Bob. Uh, Cheech went over to Michael and asked him if uh, that story was true. And, and Michael said, yeah, yeah, he discovered us. Yeah, that was Bob Taylor. And then Michael asked me, he tried to talk a little comedy with me. He said, Tommy, do you think Bobby's funny? Now, I took it to mean, did I think Bobby was gay? And because Bobby was notorious, he's got a reputation of having a, a, a big uh, a Ron Jeremy, you know. And so, and I thought, is he gay? Yeah, probably. And so, <laughs> so I said, yeah, he probably is funny. And, but he was trying to talk comedy, you know. He, Michael, like he likes to be an expert of everything. But yeah, he was, it was fun. It was, that, that whole year was crazy. How did that band then? How did that band, did you guys break up? Oh, yeah, immediately. <laughs> as soon as you get a hit, well, you know, as soon as they, they, they could pull Bobby away from the rest of the band. You see, They just want the singer. They don't want the band. And so, so that's what they did, the producers. You know. And then I got fired. I got fired from Motown. But because Barry knew my contribution to everything, because we met Barry uh, right right in the beginning went over to his house and and, and we had uh, Tom Baird the guy that wrote the, the music genius that wrote does your mama know about me the music he uh, he we had to fly him in because we just showed up with the band and Barry wanted the songwriters you know, that's what he was looking for so we we got Tom Baird in there and Tom Baird has got this thing of perfect pitch he could hear anything a doorbell or something he'll tell you what note it is and he, he mesmerized Barry Gordy with, Barry Gordy would, when he heard the doorbell, and Tom na na named off the, the notes. Barry went over to the piano and checked it out. Oh, it's right, it's right. So he, he really, and, and Barry would always talk to me, even though we never had a, a leader of the band. I was, you know, the, uh, the unofficial leader. And so Barry always talked to me. So when I got fired, because after the band broke up, Bobby went on his own. We had to back up a singer named Chris Clark, which was a, a cool gig. But I had to get a green card because we were Canadians and we'd, uh, we got self-deported from, from Motown and uh, into uh, Windsor. And so I, I had to miss a gig to go get my green card, you know, because you don't mess around with the green card. And so the, the tour manager at the time, a singer named Johnny Bristol, he told me, he says, if you leave, you're fired. And I, I, I didn't even argue with him. I just said, okay. So I, had to get, I got my green card to come back, and I was fired. And, and my girlfriend at the time, Shelby, <laughs> she was in the motel. That was the reason I had to go. They never gave me a ticket back from, from uh, Detroit to Cherry Hill, New Jersey, where it was. I had to go back and get my guitar, my instruments, my girlfriend, and the baby. <laughs> so you go back with Shelby that long? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. I and she was, she was the one that said, I walked in. She says, oh, you're finished early. And I said, no, I got fired. She says, that, that's good, honey. Come to bed. That band sucked. That was my lady that said that. And so... Oh, yeah, she was the one that 
got it got me <coughs> then I, then I, we we got a nice settlement from Barry and Gordy you know because Barry phoned me up right away and he said man you're not fired come on and I said I think I <laughs> I'm going to stay fired I want to become a Barry Gordy I don't want to just work for one and Barry says I I respect that so he gave me five thousand dollars and a little severance and we went to California and. And then from the California, I had to go back to the nightclubs because I had no band. Now, the nightclub you had in Vancouver yeah. would have become a strip club. Well, no, I had two. Uh, they both were given to me. The first club was an after-hours club. The guy that owned the building, he knew the band. He said to me, do you want a club? And I said, yeah. And there was an empty steakhouse. So we opened an after-hours club there and it went for like five years, incredibly packed every night because we had the good music and then because we'd done that with that club this other failing uh what do you call it uh, a dinner club you know uh a friend of mine it was in chinatown bad location but he said uh, do you want another club <laughs> i said yeah sure so we opened uh we we changed it from a dinner club into a strip joint for vancouver's first strip joint and we had pictures we got a documentary coming out it, It'll show all that that era. Now, what year was the strip club? That was in the 60s. It was 60, probably 65, 66, 67. Wow. Yeah, around there. And where does Cheech come into all this? Well, I started the strip club after I, I came back from uh, being fired from Motown. Now, one question. Are you <clears throat> smoking pot through all this? Oh, yeah. You're already smoking pot. Oh, yeah. What were the popular strains in 66? Like... Uh, <coughs> Colombian gold. It was called Panama Red. It was called some. You got some? Yeah, I got some. That's it. I need some. Didn't matter. We mostly hash in, in Vancouver. Right, right, yeah, right, right. Because right. we got hash from Vietnam, actually. We got a lot of weed right coming from, it was during the war. And so we had a lot of uh, weed coming in. And then they, they would smuggle from India and that, you know, the hash, mostly hash. Cause With hash a stamp is, on it. Yeah, yeah, See, but there I, were hash balls. They would make hash balls, stick it in the in the speaker cabinet of uh, bass guitars. That's one way of, of doing it. We smoked a lot of hash mostly, but when we uh, when we got the strip club, when I came back to work the strip club, it was a, it was going good. You know, the, the girls were dancing, and, and, and we had a singer and a band playing, and that, but it was boring. And I'd, I'd seen Second City, and I'd seen uh, the committee in Vancouver, I mean, in Los Angeles. And so I had an idea of t turning the girls into actresses instead of having them. Because they, when they would come to work, they were beautiful, young, fresh, you know, beautiful. And then we'd put on that strip costume and everything. Else. They, they started looking a little slutty, you know. And so I thought, wow, it'd be great if I got them on stage as they are and then strip. <laughs> you know, and and then do it in in the context of a, of a play or of a, of a bit, you know, and so we changed the strip thing into a into a improvisational acting thing, uh, and then we had a straight man. Uh, first of all, we had a, a tap dancer that was uh, Taps Harris, you know, black guy who was tap dancer. He would he was the MC for the strippers. And so when I changed the show in, into a play, the play, the first play was, it was a, a, the pajama party. And so the, the girls would act, the stage was their, ba was their bedroom. And, and so they would come over and greet each other. Hey, how are you doing? And oh, that was, like they, after the gig. And so they would get out of their, their, their street clothes and put on their little baby doll pajamas. You know, it was a strip joint, a uh, strip uh, show. And then, Taps comes over to visit him, and and they said, Taps, man, uh, why do they call you Taps? And he said, well, yeah, he's a tap dancer. Well, show us what you got. You got. You got. And so we had a band, so they would play a tap music and tap danced. He was so good that he got an encore, <laughs> <laughs> and he was pretty old. Encore almost killed him. <laughs> so he quit that night. He says, I can't do this, man. I'm out of here. And so I had a doorman that was a very funny guy named Dave, Dave Graham. And I said to Dave, Dave, I need an MC. You know, I need a, a guy on stage. And he says, I'll do it if you do it. 
And so I said, okay. And so next thing I know, Dave and I were two long-haired hippies on stage doing doing comedy. And then uh, we had a straight man hired. Then soon, as soon as we turned it into a, a, an acting thing, all the actors converged on the club. And so we had a straight man, an actor named Rick Lenz. And only trouble is that we got so popular, the 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 newspaper had a had a front page picture of Rick Lenz with girls with big titties on either side of him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Rick was like a, kind of a religious nut, and his wife was a real religious nut, and so mm -hmm. she really literally called him, pulled him out of there by his ear. You know, you're 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 quitting, and so we needed a straight man, and so this uh, Russian. Uh, publisher of the hippie magazine he's I, I know just the guy he's this guy uh he's really funny his name is richard Marin, and so he's come on meet him so i went out and met, met cheech for the first time and he was a little looked like johnny mathis clone you know the short hair he looked, looked like a little moony you know and so uh, i met him and i said i told him what we were doing and he said oh, okay i'll come down and check it out so he came down and the reason i hired him it was when he walked in, because we had the improv thing set up. We had a, a doors and curtains, and so we're backstage, and we could see the audience. And I looked out, and he walked in with one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. You know, she had a long, full-length mink coat, tall, beautiful brunette, just gorgeous. And Cheech walked in, you know, like, like he owned the place. I said, this guy's got something going, so... He saw he saw the show. He liked the show, and so he, we hired him. and uh, And he was he was the understudy for for a couple of months. And then when my brother fired us because we weren't making any money, we had turned the crowd from a, a strip joint, you know, guys that would throw money, you know, all, at anything, to a, a, what do you call it? actors or a theater. See other people coming, and they would order a wine and count their change. You know, <laughs> excuse me, you still owe me a dollar. You know that kind of thing. And so we we were losing money. And so my brother said we had we have to go back to the strip uh, format. You know, so you guys are out of here. And so Cheech and I, and so everybody out, the girls went right back stripping, no problem. Dave went right back on the door. And Cheech and I were the only ones that were going, well, what are we going to do? So we put a band together, you know, because I'm a musician, he's a singer. But we never, our first gig, we never played one note. We just went out and did comedy, all the bits that we had done on, on stage, and that was the, the beginning of Cheech and Chong. And what year was that? That was 1969. 1969. Now, what made you, at that time, because now if you look back, it's visionary. Yeah. What made you put the first album together? Oh, easy. Uh, Cheech and I came down for to struggle. The first club we worked was Red Fox's Club. Down here? Yeah. Where yeah. was Red Fox's Club? It was on La Cienega. It was the only only co comedy club in, in town. 1970. Uh, that was 1969 still. Or 70. No, it was 70 then. It was 70. And, uh, yeah, Red wasn't in town. He was out working. And uh, Norma uh, Mailer, uh, she was the manager. So she, she she had us come down there. She couldn't pronounce her name, Cheech and Chong. She called us Geek and Gank. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, here they are, Geek and Gank. What? <laughs> so we, uh, we did a bit. And then Lenny Bruce's entourage. Lenny had died a couple of years earlier. And so his entourage, including Sally Marr, they would come to the, all the clubs, or the Red Fox Club, looking for the other Lenny. And they, they saw Cheech and Chong, and, and so Tony Biscara, uh, Le Lenny's uh, brother, uh, father-in-law, his young guy, him, Chicano, also ex-Jailbird, he, uh, he spotted us, come up to me right away, and he goes, uh, you know, you're, you're the you, you guys are the closest thing to Lenny since since Lenny died, and and he became not a not a, so much a manager. Although I hired him every chance I got, I hired him, tried to get him to be a roadie for us. That didn't work out and because he was a junkie, you know. So I tried, I tried. Then just before he died, I hired him as a writer for uh, Nice Dreams. But 
the reason we got the record was um, we did a not, we were almost the regulars at the Troubadour for the Hoot Nanny night. And we started going down there. You had to go there. You had to line up at nine in the morning, get there at nine and at least around nine o'clock, year earlier if you had to, so you could be first in line. And then we'd wait till six o'clock till the to the box office open, and then we would sign up, and then we'd be the sixth one on, on stage. We had the the nice time, and so we did that for a few, almost a year, and then Lou Adler heard about us, came down, saw us, and uh, invited us to meet in his office. We went in there, and because I had that Lenny Bruce, uh, you know, background, listening to records, especially up in Canada, you know, uh, I knew how to do a comedy record. So, so when Lou said, what do you want? What do you want? And I said, well, let's do a comedy record. And he said, okay, what do you need? And we said, give us a couple of grand, and we're in. He wrote a check, boom. We paid the rent, and we were off to the races. You know, Chung, I, uh, I'm not woke. As they say, you have to be woke in this society, but there's still things that I remember from my youth that still overtake who I am today. I've shot two comedy specials, and I've hated them both. I have a great time doing albums. One of my best pieces of work, I think, is an album I did. Oh, I and, want to hear it. And But the funny thing is, I came from an album me society. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Delirious came later. When I was growing up, you couldn't go on YouTube and watch Lenny fucking Bruce. No. So I didn't get into Lenny Bruce till basically YouTube came on. When I got into comedy, somebody gave me a VHS of Lenny. Yeah. But even when it comes to the podcast... The main reason why I wanted to start a podcast was to make America listen again. Yeah. Something we have forgotten. Yeah. I learned to listen yeah. because of Los Cochinos, <laughs> Big Bamboo, yeah. was it something I said, and Bicentennial Nigga. Those four albums taught me how to listen, yeah. but they also set the groundwork for me to what I wanted my comedy to sound like. I don't want it perfect. Yeah. I want it fucking gritty. Yeah. I like grit, okay? What, what, what makes you laugh? What makes me laugh. Yeah. Your albums are brilliant, yeah. and they'll never, ever happen again in the comedy realm because they're too overproduced. No, no. In today's world, we overproduce nothing. Yeah. Well, it's you, the producers. They're, they're the king. They're the ones that do it. They're the ones that do it. In yeah. my world, me in a perfect Joey Diaz world, the best special I've ever seen in my life is Richard Pryor from that fucking coffee shop with the menu behind him. Yeah. Okay? Because I felt like I was there. Yeah. You see a special now and there's theaters and there's curtains and they show us walking and smoking a joint. That never happened. Yeah. That never happened. I like grit. Yeah. I like that 70s grit. Yeah. I miss it. I miss the and today you tape something, you know, music. Do you hear any live albums anymore? Do they even make fucking live albums anymore? No. No. They have lost an art. We no. took away an art from us. They don't even use musicians anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Now they want to do, uh, you know. They, they know. sample everything. They sample everything. And no, now they're doing the hologram tour. She's coming on the show pretty yeah. soon for Ronnie James Dio. But people that understand, I, I, have you here, seen? Have you seen the hologram thing? I saw pictures. Yeah. I've seen pictures. Uh, they, they tried to get us involved in it, but. And you know, it, it, it's like a magic show. It's like a, yeah, it was, they're not there. That's not Tupac. You know, it might be his, it might be his music. It might look like him, but it's it's not Tupac. You know, and so what the fuck? You know, or you know, they got they said they can bring Elvis back, or they can bring all that. No, no you can bring a, a picture a, of him a back picture singing. of him. But we we see that on TV every day. You know, there's nothing. You can watch any commercial. You're going to see that shit. You know. So there's nothing to to entice you to go in your pocket and pay some money to go see a, a hologram of somebody else that you know is not there. <laughs> you know, there's something to say about the human flesh. You know, it's real. You know, but it's 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 very weird that if you see, look to my left, 
I, I still have old Reliable. And yeah. I have comedy albums on it. Yeah, I see that. I love and that. And I love that. <laughs> Some nights I have nothing to do with the house. The baby goes to sleep at 830. And I'll come here and I'll put an album in. And first off, it ain't an album unless it has a little bump to it. Yeah. So even if, <laughs> if you find <laughs> Big Bamboo today, yeah. Yeah. like if you go to a, a Amoeba and somebody sold it from the yeah. Rise sale or something oh, like that. Oh, we sign them all the time. We sign them all the time. And I'll tell you something. The true professionals never touch that paper. No. They have never touched that rolling paper no, in no. it. It wasn't meant to be rolled. It, it's a rolling. I don't think it has glue. It doesn't have glue. No, no glue. It is not a good paper. So people were still putting weed in there. You don't know how many parties I went to where people were like, we rolled the joint with the paper, and all of a sudden their hair's on fire and shit because the thing blew up in their face. Or they would take a little corner of the paper. Right. I mean, why destroy a piece of art for a fucking paper? You can get a cigarette paper anywhere. But why? But till today, yeah. When I go to New York City, yeah. when I'm here in town, I buy papers, the white ones. Yeah. What are the white ones? Zig-zags. They come white, orange, and the other one. Zigzags. 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 Yeah. As soon as I step off the fucking plane, <laughs> I buy bamboo <laughs> and Easy Wire. <laughs> I'm still a big bamboo guy. I, I was smoking big bamboo when weed came with seeds. Yeah. When you would light it up and it would explode. Yeah. I had a dealer that used to hit the seeds with. With hammers, Just crush them up, crush them up to get weight, <laughs> and you couldn't finish smoking, or they would explode. They would go pop. Every shirt you had had a burn mark in it because people, the seeds would blow all yeah, over. The pop, like popcorn. popcorn. Yeah. You don't know how many times I will sit in this chair and talk to people about the value of albums in this country, and I think that you guys with the big bamboo really opened up a lot yeah. of people's minds. With that rolling, where okay. did you get that idea? Actually, <clears throat> and Big Bamboo went along with you. Oh, for sure, they loved it. They've been sending me all sorts of shit. They're trying to re- get me going again uh, with the Big Bamboo. Uh, Lou Adler was a marketing genius, genius. And so what he did, he he found the right artist. Now the only problem, he had a hard like a lot of producers, he had a hard time paying <laughs> paying them the artist. And so what happened, the guy that, that designed Big Bamboo, he got paid for that. But then they went on another photo shoot and they tried to do a re, uh, another one. And they got uh, tons of people, they had Faye Dunaway and, and Warren Beatty, everybody else at this photo shoot. And, but it never, never made the cut. And so, the, so Lou never paid the guys. And so the guys just contacted me re- recently the artist and said we got all this material do you, would you like it uh, and we're shooting we're doing a documentary i said uh yeah <laughs> thank you and so he brought all this treasure trove of, of, of cheech and i in a photo shoot and, uh, stuff material no one's ever seen uh before but that was that it was the uh, artist craig braun was the guy that did the bamboo the bamboo album he did the Rolling Stone too. He did the tongue, the Rolling Stone. Really? Yeah. Now let me ask you a question, because this was in 2019 when you released an album with a rolling paper in it. It was 1972. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Vietnam was either ending. No, oh, no, it was, it was still on. Still on. I think Vietnam Victor. went to 73. Vietnam was still around. You yeah. know, you couldn't go to your nearest dispensary. You couldn't go to the corner and light a joint and talk to your friend on the corner because a cop helicopter would be there. Was there any backlash at the time? I mean, what was... It was uh, when when it suited their purposes. You know, like, remember when... when, um, What's that singer that uh, got caught showing his dick on stage? Louis C.K.? No, no, way back. The singer... uh, uh, Morrison, Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison took his dick out in Miami. In Miami. In Miami. Right. Okay, so when he did that, then the hall, all those venues put a, a clause in their contract that if you broke that, any kind of piece like that, uh, you you have to pay the hall $5,000. And so when Cheech and I played the same hall in Tampa, Florida, they arrested us for obscenity. And... Uh, but they didn't charge us. It was just a scam so the hall owner could make an extra five grand. <laughs> and and uh, 
So Cheech and I got taken to jail, and but that was funny. We got a funny bit. And what was obscenity? What, what was it? it? Was us acting like? Well, I don't know what it was. I think we were acting like dogs. We get on our hands and knees and and sniff each other's butts. And I think what happened, they had the the cops lining around the stage facing the audience, you know, as if they're going to stop stop some kind of riot or something. And so Cheech, when he was a dog, he walked over on his hands and knees and he picked up one of the cop's hats off his head and, and act like he was peeing on the cop, you know. I think that might have contributed somewhat to us being arrested. <laughs> but we got arrested. They put us in jail, man. Now, see, I've been in, incarcerated a few times, you know, when I was young. Cheech, his father was a, was cop. a cop. Right. And Cheech, I mean, he breaks into a sweat just thinking about jail. And so he, <laughs> he, was, he was not... At first, when we went to jail, we didn't think we were going to be there long. You know, we just got off stage. You got a standing ovation, everything else. Next thing you know, we're sitting in a holding cell with a bunch of other people. And and this one Chicano guy in jail, he goes to Cheech in Spanish, you know, what, what are you in jail for? And Cheech, uh, uh, drugs. You know, he didn't want to say in obscenity, so he said drugs. And so the, the Latino guy goes, oh, tell him a black guy sent it to you. <laughs> And tell him a black guy could give it to you. And that was our thing. And then Cheech, when we were in, in jail, <laughs> he was teasing the, the, the guard. He said, oh, jail tendy, jail tendy, could we have some uh, pink toilet tissue in here, please? And, and you don't fuck around with, with guards. <laughs> because no. they, 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 they hear everything. They act like they don't hear anything, but they hear everything and they know exactly who said it. And so we were there so long that we ended up sitting down because before that we're standing up waiting to get released and then, oh, we're longer and longer. And then the, then the, the same guard, the Cheech Bug, he said, the Cheech, hey, you, come with me. <laughs> and all I heard was Cheech was leaving and said, my dad's a cop. <laughs> you know, my dad's a, a, a LAPD. <laughs> Trying to convince the guy that he was... Uh, he was on their side, you know. but we got out, and, and it was a big publicity thing. We got a picture of our mug shots. And you sold more tickets. Yeah, made oh, you more popular. Oh, just made it. Yeah, you know, just got an international press on that one. Yeah, that's the same as me going to jail. Same thing, you know. I turned into an icon, you know. So it, it didn't bother me. didn't bother my fans at all, you know. You know, so here I am, a young kid. I'm into the albums. I'm into Pryor. I'm into smoking marijuana, the whole thing. And then, boom, now you're doing movies. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't have time to watch the movies before you came on. I thought it would be cheesy to all of a sudden start hitting you with questions. I remember two things from the movie. The band, when Cheech came out with the tutu bar, <laughs> I forget the song he was singing, I Want to Be in the Marijuana. Mama Tucker, do me trying to tell you. That, you know, I mean, come on. When you're 12 or 13 and you take oh. a, hit of, a red mic with Dot Acid and take the number one bus to Jersey City, <laughs> by the time you get to Jersey City, you're on fire. And you walk into this, you know, th this is just uh, sitting here watching you. I'm listening to you, but I didn't really understand the power that is Chung yeah. till today. This is 60 years of real. This isn't yeah. okey doke shit. No. This is from Michael Jackson to Motown to yep. to movies to records to, to, you know, I mean, the movies and your albums tracked mm -hmm. back then. Yeah. Like they made it to like number 10. Or oh, yeah. Number no. 20. I, I mean, this is just phenomenal. Did you think this was the way when you were? When you were putting down the vocals of Big Bamboo, did you see 2019? No. No. What were you thinking at the time? Yeah. You're eating? We are just you got a actually, wife, you're we're, happy? We're, we're right in, in, in the middle of creating. When we first, the first bit we did was an accident. You know, uh, after we got our money from Lou, you know, the thousand, a couple of thousand dollars. And, and I said, oh, and we need a little tape recorder. I thought that would be a nice little added thing and so he got his secretary got us a little tape recorder and so Cheech and I went in the back 
mixed down room in the A&M studios. And we were practicing, we were rehearsing. And so Cheech was so used to working live that he went outside, he put on his costumes and everything else. He's gonna be a dope dealer. And, and he go, goes outside and the door locks from the inside. And it was really hot out there. It was like in the A&M in the middle of summer and the sun's beating down on him. And so he knocked on the door, he goes, and I'm supposed to let him in. He goes, so I was trying to record the, 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 sound, the little tape recorder. And so when he knocked, I looked up at the door and I didn't see if the, if the needle was moving or not. And so I said, uh, who is it? And, and Cheech says, it's me, man. And I looked down and I seen the needle moving, so it's recording. And so I'm looking at it, staring at it, and it was that pause. And then he knocked again. So I said, oh, I thought, I'll start the bit over again. So I said, who is it? And I heard it in his voice. Little pissed off. It's it's me, man. Open up. Come on. I, I think the cops saw me. So now I got him outside. The door is locked. He can't get in. I'm waiting for him to knock again <laughs> because he's so so disciplined. Once we get into a bit, he can't get out of it. And so he knocks again. This time a little harder. And I go, Who is it? Who is? It's me, man. Dave. Dave, now let me in, it's hot out here. And I said, Dave? Yeah, yeah, Dave. Then I said, Dave's not here. <laughs> <laughs> there was a pause and then he <laughs> blew it. He went, come on man, quit fucking around, it's hot out here, now let me in, let me in, you know. And so I opened the door and he, he almost wanted to punch me. He was beat red, he was sweating. <laughs> I said, wait, 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 listen, listen. And I played it back. And that was the beginning of our record career. Not only the beginning of our, our recording career, but it was the beginning of our style of how we would do it. We didn't need anybody. We didn't need a lot of engineers. We just needed one guy to work the tape recorder and with a little room, and that's all we had. And then we put all the sound effects, everything else in there. The first time, Dave's Not Here was recorded on the big stage with Lou Adler. Lou Adler did the whole thing. He did uh, Blind Melon Chitlin and all that, you know. Because after we did Dave's Not Here, they said, okay, what else you got? And Cheech and I looked at each other. We hadn't even thought about writing another bit. And so we just did our live show, which was Blind Melon Chitlin. And it was, uh, and Blind Melon Chitlin was a, uh, a bit that I got from the committee. The committee used to do a bit on a blind blues singer, and so I, not I was influenced by it. Let's say it that way. Put it that way, and and so we made up the record, the Blind Melon Chitlin, as in the in the studio, and uh, and then we realized that we didn't need all the engineers and the producers and everything else, and so Cheech and I just. Just the producer, and I mean the engineer, and Cheech and I, Norm Kenny and Cheech and Chong, and we worked every day, just going there. We were just very re relaxed, like we're doing now. Exactly. Yeah. This is very brilliant. I mean, these stories, uh, like I said, now while I'm talking to you, I'm getting to see how much you influenced what you guys did. Oh, yeah. Stuck with me forever like i before i did this podcast the person was editing it and i didn't really enjoy it and it was basically because of what you guys did with your albums yeah they sounded so raw yeah and that's what i've always liked i've always liked i'm gonna i'm never gonna shoot a special again i mean i really don't want to shoot a special no shoot. i want to tape shit i want to put it on vinyl next time yeah. i want to put my shit on vinyl and I want people to have the same experience that you gave me. Yeah, that experience has been taken away. Uh, we had um, the guy from Guns N' Roses a few weeks ago, Duff McKagan. Duff McKagan, Duff. And oh, we yeah. were talking about that, that what it meant for children to have a paper route, deliver fucking newspapers all week, you get paid on Saturday, and Saturday, me, Tony, Lee, and Chung would walk down Sunset when we were 12, to your favorite record store. Mm -hmm. And you were going to get Led Zeppelin too, Chong, don't fuck around. <laughs> get Richard Pryor, 
because Chong was always the one that would switch his fucking mind. We got there. <laughs> I don't want to get Richard Pryor now. My dad's a little, no, oh, get Richard fucking Pryor. But that, you know, you got these albums, you took them home. You know, explain to them how you opened the album, oh, and you yeah. read the credits, and while you were reading the credits, you, art. you cleaned your weed yeah. on the album cover, and then you took your weed. That's why sometimes you go buy a secondhand album, and if it opens up, there's two seeds in there, and it does something to your yeah. heart, like your heart gets a little crippled. You guys took yeah. it one above. Yeah. You guys took, to me, once you guys put the rolling paper in that album, that created... Uh, Album covers like Some Girls from the yeah. Stones, which you could rotate, and Led yeah. Zeppelin Three. I think you could also rotate. It gave people more freedom what to do with their albums. I don't know if you ever thought about it from no. that no. direction. No, this we, shit was genius to me that, like I said, till today, I still believe in it. And I believe the record companies, the money is down because you don't entertain people like that anymore. If I buy something from, from Chung now, I open it up and it's just a disc. Yeah. There's no pictures of the tour. Nothing. There's no pictures of you in the recording studio. No. no. You in your bathroom with your pants off with a big <laughs> joint in your mouth. That's what we want to see. A poster. Yeah. A poster of you yeah. and 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 Shelby with the dog. Yeah. And he's got a hemp hat on. Yeah, who gives a fuck? Yeah. That those little things yeah. made that seven ninety five come out of your pocket yeah. a lot easier. Yeah. It, you know what? Even if the album is a five. Look at the fucking poster. How cool is this? Yeah. And he yeah. gave you a fucking rolling paper. So. And a lot of times, uh, you had a you couldn't play it right away. You had to wait until your the mind was right. Oh, you had to smoke twenty two joints. Yeah, you had to, and, and then you had to be very special. Yeah, you had to have your head in the right spot. See, I when I was coming up, you know, a poor ass musician. You know, I was married before Shelby. In fact, Shelby was a neighbor, <laughs> and, and uh, my first wife, Maxine, she was the one that uh, that supported me. You know, and she was the one I had a shit job, and she <clears throat> quit that job. You know, and so I quit, and I just started playing music. And then next thing you know, the guy gives us a club, and we we got some money coming in. But being poor and and just concentrating on what you love to do man that really helped and i i could never have done it without the help of uh, ladies you know my wife me neither my I'd be uh, my wife was gone for five days i didn't even know where the fucking underwear are <laughs> i don't even know how to turn the fucking stove on in my house i don't know how to do the microwave and stuff i don't know how to turn the fucking stove on in my house i gotta tell you something uh i know your time is limited uh, i don't i wanted you to say that you influenced me in so many ways and you've you're a true fucking hero of mine because you influence America on the knowledge of marijuana. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You came along, Ozzy Osbourne wrote fucking uh, Sweet Leaf. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, listen to the lyrics to Sleep, yeah. we, Sweet Leaf. Yeah. Someday, you know, the world Ooh, will love you. I should have, I'll, I'll get, uh, I, I was in Boulder. We were talking about Boulder. Yeah, you were Boulder, there last week. And, uh, and this, I was a, get a, I got invited by this top astrologist. She's in Boulder, uh, Deborah Silberman. She said, "Oh, you got to meet this girl." And so, but the hippie, this hippie girl. I went, I went back in time. It's, it was all of a sudden I was in the '60s again, and and then her girlfriend, she's turned lesbian. She, her girlfriend, is this uh, singer, singer that wrote all these great. Um, weed songs and it's like a rap sounds like uh, uh taylor swift sounds like her doing a song about weed it's so cool and i and she gave me a, a couple of her cds i'll get them over to you okay you'll love them i mean you play them on your show you, oh man you'll love them this has been uh very eye-opening for me because i didn't see all the great things you did to you in front of me i mean you're the real deal motown mm -hmm comedy duo movies miami vice you went to jail and now also, you're out slinging dick like it doesn't end and i also helped uh, wolf of wall street you know the wolf right. of wall street right uh, i helped uh, he him and i shared the cubicle and so i would i was writing my book you know my memoirs and he would be playing tennis and jordan belford he'd come in he said what are you doing i said i'm writing writing a book he goes oh i'm gonna write a book 
And so he started writing, and then he handed me a page. And it was like a copy of uh, Thomas Wolfe, uh, Bonfire of the Vanities, you know, all word for word almost, you know. I said, ah, you haven't written shit, man. And because he's a genius, you know, he got all upset. He's, well, what do you think I should write? I said, write those stories you've been telling me every night, you know. And I give him a little hint. I says, the, the key is the most of. You don't just get high. You get higher than anybody's ever gotten high in cinema, you know. So he, he took me to heart. Next thing I know, he gets out of jail. I get out of jail. And he comes over to my house. We, because we were both on probation, we couldn't talk to each other, you know, face to face. So he's in his car. He peeps his horn. He goes, hey, I sold my book. It's going to be a movie. It's going to be uh, Scorsese. He's going to direct it. Oh, shit. Just like that. And so he's been going around uh, giving lectures and that now and telling everybody that I helped him write, a, write his book. So, yeah, my, 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 I, I'm, I'm, I'm on a very special path, man. I'm meeting all sorts of people. You know, I watched John Rogan, and you said that when you, very interesting, you said that when you went to jail, you yeah. turned it into a religious yeah. experience, like a religious retreat. Yeah. And I really identify with you at that time yeah. because I looked at it as I looked at it as a as a Buddhist. Yeah. I didn't look at it as a Catholic. No. I was going in there to solve my sins, pay for them, yeah. and I had a second chance at life to start over. This yeah. is the ultimate payment for your sins. This covers all of them. Yeah. You didn't get arrested for the bong. No. You didn't go to jail for the bong. That no. was just a story that the universe made up. Yeah. For you to pay you no no I was, you've had. no I was in there to cleanse get, get really acquainted with myself again yeah and that's what it did for me too I didn't have peace of mind for eight years I went in there and I met Joey Diaz you meet the wants and you also realize what you don't want ever yeah, again in what your you life. don't need what you don't need in your yeah. life yeah I want to thank you for the great gifts you sent me from pure hemp yeah the the what's it called Chang's blend Chang's choice. Chance Chance choice, choice, yeah. That half a joint took me to fucking, <laughs> took me back to up and smoke. You know what I'm saying? I seen you. I, I seen you. Yeah, I remembered the mama told me how to live. And I want to tell you, you're always welcome here if you want to bullshit whatever you want to do. Okay. You have a lifelong. I'm your new nephew because okay. I'm not even a fan. I'm beyond the fan. I, I love. That. I was more starstruck today with your conversations. And your beauty and your journey. This fucking journey has been, mm -hmm. if, if if God forbid, if God takes you tomorrow on the way up, you're going to go, mm -hmm. I did a beautiful journey. I introduced people to two of the greatest gifts that you could give somebody. Laughter mm -hmm. and the gift of reefer. Thank you. The gift of reefer. When you turn somebody on to reefer and they really need it in their soul and it covers that spread for them that they don't need alcohol, they don't need anything else, just reefer. You feel good. I don't know how anybody else feels. I feel good. I don't feel good when I dose Lee with 6,000 milligrams of THC <laughs> and he sleeps here for two days. That doesn't make me feel good. That's a little bit good. <laughs> That's a joke that you and I have a great sense of humor. Yeah. I bet you're great at dosing people too. Like, mm -hmm. take a hit of this. It won't do nothing to you. And Cheech. Next to you. That's oh, yeah. My, oh, many times. How many times did you talk? So he was my Cheech. <laughs> well, I don't have to with him. He does it on himself. On himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He had a date with Joni Mitchell one time. She was playing a concert in, in Paris, and we were shooting a movie in Paris, and he had and him and Joni had you know, kind of secretly dated on the side, and so she was, a, she was going to appear in, in Paris, and so he had a piece of hash, and he did no way to smoke it, so he thought, fuck it. He, he, so he ate it, the whole chunk of hash. He, he got so stoned, he forgot to eat. <laughs> He didn't order food. We were at the restaurant. <laughs> he, everybody got their food, and I looked over, and Cheech is nothing in front of him. He was that stone, man. I, I've been there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's he, and he still does it to this day, and he tries not to. That's what I love about him, you know. Because uh, no, 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 yeah, I, I can't do that. I can't do that. And then he he picked up a syringe one time, and he thought, oh, I'll just do a little bit. And he, he squirted <coughs> almost. It was like Rick Simpson oil. This shit will put you away for 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 a month. What's Rick Simpson oil? Is it's this the, the stuff that cures cancer? Yeah, yeah. It's so, <laughs> it's so strong. It's so strong. Literally, 
the cancer cell will say, fuck it, I'm out of here. You know, <laughs> because it's too strong. Where did you have a syringe from? Where did he have a syringe? Well, that's all. No, you, you, you it's like, oh, It's like oil, hash oil, right? Yeah, so oh, it's like, okay, oh, okay, I see what yeah, you're saying. Yeah. It's, a, it's like Black Widow type yeah. stuff. And right? he, okay. took, he took a whole mouthful. <laughs> the, his wife said he was projectile vomiting. <laughs> vomiting was hitting <laughs> And that was one time. Then he goes to Israel and he goes to the Wailing Wall, does the same thing. He thought, oh, he thought it was a, a breath mint. At the Wailing Wall? Yeah, and he oh. puts, he puts, his, he puts a, a whole a dose of something in his mouth at the Wailing Wall. And, but he started barfing in the, in the cab. So. Oh, thank God. <laughs> it wasn't bad. He turned the Wailing Wall into the puking wall. And, oh, my God. Oh, man, Cheech is great, man. You gotta have cheat shot. And you're back on? You're back on the road again? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And full tour starting in September. Yeah. How yeah. can these people get to your dates? Uh we we were we, What's that? Live Nation. Live Nation. Live Nation. Com. There's no chung.com or the feds won't let you get another web page. That's oh, no. part of your parole. And there's Cheech and Chong dot com. There's okay. uh Chong's Choice. Okay, okay. So there's a shitload of them. So they can find the dates on Live Nation and on Cheech and Chong dot com. But Joy I gotta go take a piss. Do your thing. Okay. I love you to death. I love you guys. Chong, I wanna thank you again. You're a gentleman and a true fucking no, pioneer. Yeah, yeah, pee, right? Go! <laughs> go, you fuck. No, 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 I'm just gonna keep talking. I love you guys. Thank you very much for listening to the church of what's happening now. I wanna thank Chong again. I wanna thank Tony for bringing him up here. I wanna thank you for bringing up the weed for us. Thank you. And the pure hemp. And real quick, while I have you here, uh, that's it. I'll be in Columbus next Friday and Saturday night. Columbus Funny Bone, 7 and 9. I don't know what the fuck the time is. Make sure you're there. That's all I'm asking, all right? Then on the 5th of July, I'm at the rec room in Orange County, but don't worry about that. Let's worry about potato salad and all that shit. For right now, all you got to worry about is fucking the Funny Bone Columbus, all right? Real quick, I want to give a word to our sponsors. All right, I want to thank my man Tommy Chung. That was a, a fucking great. I spent some great time with him. Every time I looked at the guy, I felt like crying because he meant that much to me in my life. I want to thank the Christ Killer, who's going to be at Skank Fest this weekend, all through New York from the East Side Comedy Club. So fucking go on his Twitter. He'll keep twitting you where he's going to be if you want to meet him. And I want to thank you guys for being fucking the church family and for always having our back. I also want to take time out to thank our sponsors because they what keeps her afloat number one cbd lion listen your days of walking around like a fucking zombo looking for cbd oil are done with okay you're walking around you're believing what this guy tells you what that guy tells you fuck them all you're paying for fucking who got you're getting garbage listen when you're looking for a reliable cbd company fuck it i got it for you you ready grab a pen cbdlion.com Lucky for you motherfuckers, I found CBD Lion. They make CBD products from start to finish. That's what CBD Lion does. They have you covered. They, it comes in a vape. It comes in cartridges. It comes in the tincture. It comes in the chatter. And don't even let me get me start on the fucking gummies. The strawberry or the raspberry gummies will put you over the fucking top. The orange ones ain't that bad either. I love their fucking gummies. I eat four of them. Before I go to bed at night, I don't wake up in the middle of the night to pee, and I'm 56. I got to pee every fucking 15 minutes. So you do the math. CBD Lion is the real fucking deal. Their products are clean. You understand me? Clean, Bobby. Not like the fakes out there at all these fucking liquor stores. My, 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 my brother. I went to the liquor store, and they go, what the fuck? He sells vodka. What the fuck does he know about CBD oil? <laughs> Uncle Joey's here. I live right in the heart of this fucking jungle here of marijuana. I'm telling you. CBD Lion is the way to go, all right? Go to CBDLion.com right now and check out their third-party results right now yourself. They got them right up on the website. Your fucking hair is going to fucking fly out of your head. That's how good CBD Lion is. So do me a favor. Go to CBDLion.com right now. Look at the fine line of stuff, whether you want to go with the shatter, whether you want to go with the cartridges. As a matter of fact, they're releasing a new 420 cartridge. 420 milligram cartridge today. Today. So go to CBDLion.com right now and press in. Church. C-H-U-R-C-H. And get 20% off your motherfucking order. That's how Joey does it here. And number two, it's summertime. I bring you tushy. Do I not? Do I not try to take care of you? Listen, 
You can wash your balls till fucking St. Geraldo's Day. The problem is you got that fucking bush down there growing out of your dicks, out of your asshole, out of your ball sack, out of your fucking belly button. So you got four contributing factors of stink going towards one fucking area, which is your nutsack. Then you sit there and you're like, I can't find nobody on Twitch. What's the fucking website? Tinder. I can't find nobody on Tinder. They come over. They don't want to suck my dick, maybe because you got a bush of death down there. But that comes to an end right now because you got Manscaped. Joey, what the fuck is Manscaped? Manscaped, they got precision tools for the family jewels, okay? Manscaped has redesigned the electric razor. Their invention, what brought them to the fucking dance, is called the lawnmower. A handheld razor with skin-safe technology. Joey, what's that? What's that? You're not going to cut your fucking dick off. That's what that is. It won't nick or snag your fucking nutsack. Because you got to go easy, guys. You got to go easy. And you just can't trust people. You, you can't ask your mother to trim your nut hairs. And you can't ask your grandmother to trim your nut hairs. <laughs> so you got to meet some fucking chick who you trust. Who you've never done nothing bad to to trim your fucking nutsack. Have you ever done that? Your, your fucking wife, you, you fart on her, you, you pull the blankets over her head. She's bound to want to cut one of your fucking nutsacks off. I mean, I wouldn't. Right or wrong? No more. Why? Because you got the manscape. This bad boy will leave you clean, smooth, anxiety free. Plus, it's rechargeable and easy to hold. You get into all the nooks and crannies, you fat little fucking cocksuckers. You got to pick your stomach up to shave that thing. How do I know? Because I'm a fat fuck myself. You got to pick your leg up and put it behind your head and trim that fucking bush of death. And it also has a little fucking knob that you can trim the outstanding hairs out of your asshole. You know what I'm saying? You can't go in there because God forbid. But Manscaped will get your bean bag looking as smooth <laughs> as a fucking egg. All right, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. If you trim the hedges, the pole of debt looks a lot fucking small, bigger, all right? So what are you waiting for? Trim up that fucking egg roll of love. You want to go out there and give some mustard to these girls in the mouth? It starts with manscaped.com. You get everything you need to make your ball shine like fucking Lee's head. You keep your dick looking <laughs> good. And if this is the first time you've considered manscaping, they got a deal for you. Grab a pen. The perfect package comes with a lawnmower. And a safety razor plus, plus the crop preserver, especially formulated deodorant so your nuts don't stink, plus the reviver. Let's say you play volleyball and you got a little wang to your nuts and your dick. You go behind a fucking phone booth or a car and you wipe out your dick with nobody watching. And you go out to the bar and give some fucking stamina juice to these fucking freaks to death. Anyway, <coughs> the church family right now today, the church gets 20% off. Your first order when you use promo code CHURCH, BAM, at manscaped.com. Again, that's manscaped.com. And if you order the perfect package, they'll also throw in a free travel bag when you use promo code CHURCH. That's manscaped.com. Use promo code CHURCH for 20% off your first order. Remember, you got to keep the nutsack clean. And it starts with manscaped.com. I want to thank Manscaped. I want to thank CBDLion.com. I want to thank all you motherfuckers for being family. Remember, I'll see you savages of death next weekend at the Columbus Funny Bone. Get your tickets today because they're going to go fast. All the potheads fucking remember they got to get tickets. All right. I love you motherfuckers. Have a great weekend. Stay black. And we'll be back Monday morning. Tip Tuesday morning. Tip top Magoo ready for you. Kick this fucking mule Lee once and for all. <laughs>